We want to go to the Word of God today directly. If you'll open your Bibles with me to Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 10th verse. Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 10th verse. We're going to read through verse number 17. Okay, what did I do? You know, I appear to have forgotten to bring any readers today. <laughs> it's what happens when you're not all together feeling. Good at the start of the service, although I gotta tell you, let out a whoop and a shout, and I feel better. Amen. <laughs> Those of you folks who don't understand Pentecost, yeah, we shout some, we get happy. Some people call it emotional. I got news for you, it's more goes well beyond emotional. Because it's not merely a matter of your emotion, it's something that gets down in your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Booby. Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17, and the word of God from the King James text today reads, And the apostles, when they were returned, told him, meaning Jesus, all they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get victuals for we are here in a desert place but he said unto them give ye them to eat and they said we have no more but five loaves and two fishes except we should go and buy meat for all this people for they were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and break, and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled. And there was taken up of fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. We've all heard the story of the feeding of, they call it often the feeding of the 5,000. But that is not the truth. There were far more than 5,000. But in ancient times when they would count a large group they would count the men not all the people but the men and uh, so it said there were 5,000 men that did not include women and children so there were probably at least 10 or 15,000 people in this audience we've all heard the story but I think today you're going to get something from this that you may never have gotten before amen if you bow your heads with me one more moment master savior soon coming king once again God we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord I came in not feeling quite so well but Lord already I feel good in my spirit oh when we all get to heaven I can't wait to see grandma I can't wait to see Grandpa. I can't wait to see my great-grandmas again. All people of great faith that loved you. But Lord, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to finally lay my eyes on the one that I have believed and trusted and walked with for all these years. Master, the Word of God must now go forth and the anointing of the Holy Ghost is necessary if it is to be effective. 
I ask God that you would touch my lips, touch my body, touch my mind. Help me to deliver the word that you've given me for the people of God at this hour. I know, God, this is the message that you laid on my heart for your people at this time. Those that are watching may feel they've happened upon our service, but I believe they're here today, God, by divine design, because you have something that you wish to impart to them by reason of your word through the ministry of your spirit. Touch the ear of every hearer. Help us to receive the word of God with gladness. O oh, Master, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children with a few fish and a five loaves of bread was far more than simply another miracle demonstrating the Lord's divinity. But rather, it also demonstrates the Lord's compassion and His willingness to feed those who put His Word first and who sought to follow Him. Hallelujah. See, you don't really think about the fact that as it got late, the disciples came to Jesus and said, you know, you need to send these people away so they can go buy themselves some food and maybe rent a room somewhere or do something because, you know, we've been out here. This is a desert environment. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. They've been here all day just listening to you teach and talk. Boy, I'm going to tell you, we got people today, you can't get them to come to church to hear the Word of God. It's air-conditioned and comfortable. Hello now. They've got these cushion pews. I remember when I was a kid in the Pentecostal church in New England that I grew up in, we had these old wooden pews, and all we had on the, on the seat portion for a cushion were these uh, rectangular cushions that were made, you know, to sit across them. They weren't the most comfortable pews in the world to sit on, but boy, I'm going to tell you, ever since I was a kid, the one the place I'd rather be in the world than in the house of God. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when you see God healing people, I used to see healings, I, I, I promise you, I used to see God healing people constantly. We saw miracles. It was constant. Every Sunday we saw God touching somebody, healing somebody. I've seen people that were supposed to be paralyzed like Christopher Reeve, supposed to be paralyzed for the rest of their life, never supposed to walk again, and I've seen them walk. I've seen people with limbs that were all twisted up to the point that they... I, oh, I remember these two ladies in a nursing home service I was conducting years ago. And bless their hearts, they, their little bodies were so twisted and so... Their feet were turned into each other and it was horrible. And the two of them were sitting in the front in wheelchairs. And I was preaching. I was all of 12 maybe 13 or 14. But I used to do nursing home ministry back then with a lady, a girl from our church named Cheryl Botella. And Cheryl and I would go to the nursing homes do services. She played guitar and sang, you know. And uh, I'd preach. And I was preaching, and I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost was powerful in that room. You could feel the presence of God. And as I was preaching, Tommy, I literally looked at these two ladies, and I sat there and I watched them, and all of a sudden I saw, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, I saw their hands straightening. And I saw their feet straightening. And they literally pushed them, the two of them, not one, two of them, side by side. And they pushed themselves up to stand up. And I couldn't believe my eyes. And the staff at the nursing home was so shocked by this that they literally ran and grabbed these women and shoved them down back into their chairs. Here a miracle was taking place, and all they were interested in, you know, is, uh, oh, we don't want the nursing home to be liable for any accidents, you know. And uh, it was just the most miraculous. I've been in services where people in wheelchairs have come up. And I'm not talking about stage miracles. I'm not talking about all this garbage you see on Benny Hinn and all this foolish. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in a little, small, country 
Pentecostal church in southern New England. And these weren't people that we didn't know. These weren't strangers who were playing a trick, you know, who were playing a game on. No, they sometimes they were members of our own church who had had accidents or had been, you know, involved in situations. But we saw miracles on a regular basis. I'm going to tell you, who on earth doesn't want to go to a church like that? When I was a kid, my father... My father hates God. My father doesn't have no use for God. Never has, never will. And he used to do everything in his power to run interference and prevent my mother from taking us to church as much as he could. And during the school year, he'd insist that she not take us to church on Sunday nights. And she not take us to church on Wednesday nights. It's school, you know, it's school nights. They shouldn't be uh, out after a certain hour on school nights. Now, if he'd have been a Christian man, then maybe the house of God would have been a higher priority, and you know. And Booby, I would sit at home and cry that I couldn't be in church on Sunday night. Because all I could imagine was, I wonder what's happening tonight. <laughs> I wonder what God's doing tonight. Somebody's going to get the Holy Ghost. Somebody is going to come into that church drunk and leave sober. I've seen that happen. Somebody's going to come into that church high on dope and leave delivered never, ever again to want to touch that substance. I've seen it happen, folks. Not a, not a time or two. I've seen it happen many, many times. The power of God is able to break the yoke of addiction. He's able to break the bondage of drug addiction and alcohol addiction. Even smoking, cigarette addiction. I've seen people come up and ask for prayer and lay their cigarettes on the altar that they had in their pocket and say, Lord... By your help, I'm never going to touch these things again. And they asked the preacher to pray for them. And they never did. Never smoked another cigarette the rest of their life. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when Jesus was teaching, He wasn't just teaching, but He was doing things. He was healing the sick. Hallelujah. He was cleansing the leper. He was raising the dead. He was testing out devils. When He sent His disciples out to preach, He told them to do the same things. He said, as He sent them out to preach, He commanded them, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's the kind of church, that's the kind of ministry that God's church is supposed to have. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when you've got a work like that, when you've got a church like that, people don't mind going to church. <laughs> People didn't mind coming to see the Lord. They didn't mind that He was preaching in the wilderness, in a desert, dry, uncomfortable place because wonderful things happened where the Word of God was being shared and where the Lamb of God was present. I'm going to tell you something today. God still can do wonderful things where the Word of God is being shared and where the Lamb of God is present. Mm -hmm. The problem is... We've got a church world that's got its mind on politics. We've got a church world that's got its mind on social issues and uh, fighting these various culture wars. And honey, i got news for you. God cannot move. God cannot bless. The power of God is not present when that's all you've got to preach. Mm, that's right. No one asked the Lord... To feed the multitude. In fact, no one even suggested he do so. They suggested he send the people away, send them home. It was the Lord who commanded his disciples to feed them, and they responded by saying, Lord, all the only resources we've got available is this here. These few fish and, and these five loaves. He did so because he knew, listen to me children, he knew they were hungry. The interesting thing about this story is 
that hunger is something human beings must always work to satisfy. We either must raise our own animals or grow our own gardens or else we've got to find the money to buy what we need. As the disciples suggested the people could do. And then, Tommy, we have to cook it or bake it. We have to do what's needed for ourselves in order to eat. Am I telling the truth now? Eating requires effort. Somewhere along the line, you've got to put effort. Whether you've got to work for the money to buy the food, or whether you've got to go out and plant a garden, or whether you've got to raise the animals, you have to work to eat. Right. That's just the way of life. That is the way of nature. But interestingly enough, the promise of God to those who would diligently seek after Him is this. Matthew 5, 1 through 6, from the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord said, And seeing the multitudes, He went up into a mountain, and when He was set, His disciples came unto Him. And He opened His mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Listen. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. He didn't say they'll find food. Hallelujah. He didn't say there'll be food available for them to buy. He said they shall be filled. Glory to God. The Lord begins his sermon on the mount with a number of hopeful and positive declarations. Among them in verse 6 is the declaration, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What do you need for God to fill you? You need to be hungry. My title, my message today is you need only be hungry. You see, God doesn't need you to beg Him. You don't have to go down in prayer. You don't have to spend hours fasting. You don't have to spend hours in prayer in order to bring down the move of God, in order to bring down a revival, in order to bring down uh, the Holy Ghost. You don't have to spend... I grew up in churches where that's what we were taught. The way to bring down the power of God and the glory of God, you had to pray it down. Glory to God. You had to put all this effort and all this energy in to begging God as it were to pour His Spirit out upon His people. But the Lord fed the 5,000 men plus women and children without anybody asking Him. Why? Because they were hungry. <laughs> he said when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to wanting to do right, he said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness to do right, he said, they shall be filled. What is he saying? He said, I'm going to feed them. Hallelujah. I'll make sure they get what they're hungry for. You know why we don't see revival in the church today? You know why we don't see a move of God in the church today? You know why we don't see the miracles we used to see in the church today? Because the church ain't hungry. All you need is be hungry. If the church were hungry, it would come. If the church wanted the kingdom of God first, as the church of God is supposed to want the kingdom of God first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What did He promise for those who are hungry for righteousness? They would be filled. If our first priority were the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then everything necessary to do the work of the kingdom, God would pour out on us in abundance. Why? Because we need it. We're hungry. Oh my goodness. I want to tell you something today. All you need only be hungry. Fasting. When we fast, 
that is one way in which we bring into the natural an important concept which we ought to be experiencing in the spiritual. You see, fasting, when we push away the plate and we do without food for a while, we're not punishing ourselves. That's not the idea. That's not what fasting is about. We're demonstrating to the Lord that spiritually we're hungry. How hungry are you? I'm so hungry spiritually that I'm willing to be hungry physically. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what the whole concept of fasting is about. When you fast, you're simply saying, Lord, look at my spirit. I'm going to show you physically what's going on in my heart. I'm hungry. I need the move of God. I need the power of God. I need the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. I need to be where the power of God is manifest in the midst of His people. By pushing away the plate, we allow ourselves to experience hunger. That same hunger we feel in our flesh ought to reflect before the Lord our spiritual hunger. Isn't it wonderful that one of the most significant events the church will participate in is the marriage supper of the Lamb? <laughs> Right from the beginning of our eternity with Jesus, we shall know the benefits and joy of being fed by the Master. Hallelujah. Growing up as I did within the Pentecostal movement, I heard any number of sermons dealing with the subject matter. What brings revival or what is needed to bring the move of God or an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? One of the most common lines of thought within the holiness-rooted Pentecostal movement is that holiness or strict adherence to a set of rules and regulations said to be from God was the answer to this all-important question. Oh, if you want to see revival, if you want to see a God pouring out His Spirit in a powerful, wonderful way, you just need to follow all these rules that the United Pentecostal Church has set out. Follow all these rules, and boy, I mean to tell you, the power of God will fall. That's a pile of manure. I'll tell you how I know, because I've been in more United Pentecostal. Oh, some of you people are going to get mad at me. Tough. It's the truth. If it wasn't the truth, I wouldn't say it. I've been in more United Pentecostal churches in the last two and a half decades that are dead as a stinking doornail. I mean, honey, they wouldn't know the Holy Ghost if the Holy Ghost came down and slapped them around the room. They don't have a move of God anymore. If somebody shouted, they'd probably drop dead of a heart attack. The pastor would be the first one on the floor. If somebody were to get happy in the Holy Ghost, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves because they hadn't seen it in decades. I watch video. Oh, I'm going to make them mad. I watch video of their general assembly which happens there. I think it's every two years or so. And I watch videos of their general assembly. And i got news for you, honey. 85% of it is spiritless and disgusted. It's dry and dead. The worship's ridiculous. You got a bunch of morons jumping around trying to act like there's something going on that ain't going on. You don't see people worshiping in spirit. You see people trying to be all joyful and trying to be all demonstrative. But they're not being motivated by the Holy Ghost. How do I know? Well, I'll tell you how I know. It doesn't take a doesn't take a seeing man to know when somebody's in the spirit and somebody ain't. Put me in her church where there's a bunch of people shouting and getting happy. And I guarantee you, I can look around the room and I'll tell you who's really in the spirit and who just, you know, kind of getting full of themselves and acting the fool. You're always going to have somebody in the crowd that's in themselves. That's just part of life. They want to get in on the party, but they don't know how to, so they just try to act like they're in the party, you know. But I'm going to tell you, look around the room, and, and you look at them 
mothers in the church. I say mothers, you know, the old saints, the women that have been in the church a while. And you look at some of them. There's a video I played before church here in the sanctuary. And there's a, a wonderful black church that I used to love to watch years ago on television. And uh, they'd be singing some songs, you know. And they pan over the audience of the sanctuary and you see some of them old ladies just getting happy in the Holy Ghost and you see them and then you see other ones just kind of dancing along, you know. And I will tell you something, I know, I can tell in a second which of them are in the Spirit and which of them are just doing their thing. It's not hard to tell the difference. And I'm going to tell you, the church today is satisfied with so much less than God's best. There's no hunger for God's best. If you allow yourself to lead the service and you've convinced yourself that the presence of the Lord was there. You convinced yourself that you had a wonderful uh, service and that the anointing was wonderful. Tommy and I went to a conference one time up in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas of a straight, straight Pentecostal uh, fellowship of churches and we just went up there to, you know, kind of blend in and we weren't there to make any statements or create any issues. And those people, remember Tommy, they talked about what a wonderful presence of God was in the service and how wonderful the services were. And I sat there and I thought, my God, I don't know what church services these people been in, but sure enough, not the same ones I've been in. I didn't feel what they were feeling, what they claimed to feel. God, news for you, the church has convinced itself. It's eating the food that should be fed to the pigs. Hello now. And convincing itself that they're feasting at the master's table. And as long as you're eating something, oh my goodness. As long as you're eating something, you know there's an old saying, sometimes people be trying to feed you bull. <laughs> And sometimes you'll say, you know what, I ain't swallowing it. I ain't swallowing it. I got news for you. There are too many people in God's church today who are swallowing a line of baloney. They're swallowing a line of lies and deceptions. They are swallowing. Preachers get up and say, oh, the anointing's been great. Oh, the power of God is really here. And you know what? They've allowed themselves to believe it hook, line, and sinker. They're eating garbage. But they're full. They're satisfied. They're not hungry for any more because they've been eating the garbage they've been fed. Well, I'll tell you something, until you get more discerning, until you start being more honest and truthful with yourself and with your God, you will never, ever see God move like God can move. I remember going to the church that was pastored by my uh, my district overseer in the Church of God up in New England when I started my first church back in the 80s, mid-80s. I was all of 19 years old, 20 years old. I think by then I had turned 20. And Brother Huggins, he was a Haitian man, pastored a wonderful Church of God in Stamford, Connecticut. And he invited me that night. We weren't going to have church that night because we had just organized my church as an official congregation in the church of God. So we had like events for the whole day. And he said, well, are y'all having church tonight? I said, no, sir. He said, well, why don't you come to Stanford and preach for me? Well, Stanford was about a, good Lord, it was almost a 90-minute drive for us. So a bunch of people from my church and I got together and we got in the car and we drove out to Stanford and uh, I preached for him that night. He had a beautiful congregation. He had a hundred and, oh heavens, at least 120, 130 people in the Sunday night service. You always have fewer people on Sunday night than you do on Sunday morning. They didn't know I was coming because, you know, it was not prearranged. 
And I got up that night and I preached. And before I even finished preaching, the Holy Ghost had begun to fall. And people were standing up all over the congregation. And I'm telling you, God was healing people. God was filling people with the Holy Ghost. Folk began to shout and get happy. I mean, the Spirit of God began to move. And, and I had an altar call for people seeking the Holy Ghost. They come down. And I mean, all of a sudden, God began to fill people with the Holy Ghost. And the altar, some of the people from, were from my own church that had come with me to visit this church. And they got the Holy Ghost that night in Brother Huggins' church. And the Spirit of the Lord moved, and my God, we had church all over the place. And afterwards, afterwards Brother Huggins said to me, Brother, you brought cat meat in. And I looked at him, and I said, Huh, what? And honestly, I kid you not, people, I'm, I am not putting on false modesty or anything. I'm a serious heart attack. I looked at him and I said, Brother, you got such a wonderful bunch of people, my Lord. Well, they really love to worship God and they really love the move of God and the Spirit of God. And, and they just love for the Lord to do things. And he said, Brother, do you think we have church like this all the time? Well, why wouldn't I think that was the case? I've never been there before, so I don't know how they have church all the time. I've been part of churches that had church like that all the time. So therefore, in my mind, yeah, of course they do, you know. He said, no, sir. He said, you brung cat meat in. He said, my God, the anointing on you was so powerful. It was like we were in cat meeting and the camp meetings you know we always had these marvelous wonderful camp meetings church of god camp meetings were some of the oh my goodness some of those marvelous things i've ever been part of in my life they always bring in quote unquote the cream of the crop preachers and it's not about them being so holy it's not about them having such wonderful uh, speaking abilities, but you know, I really believe with all my heart that what's in the pulpit is what you're going to find in the pew. In other words, the preacher got to lead. If the preacher ain't hungry, the people won't be hungry. If the preacher's satisfied with less, how in the world can he expect his people to not be satisfied with what they've got? Do you follow what I'm telling you? I remember Brother Ellis, the United Pentecostal preacher from Milford, Connecticut, many years ago preaching in a United Pentecostal camp meeting. And Brother Ellis preached and he said, Preacher, your people will never bypass you. They will never get ahead of you. So if you want your people, if you know the people of God need to rise up and they need to do better and be better, he said that you need to be better, you need to do better, you need to seek better, you know what I'm talking about? And I, that lesson was never lost on me. And Tommy, when I go into a church to preach, I go in and I'm hungry for a move of God. I'm hungry for the power of God. I want to see the Lord bless and heal and deliver and save. I want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I won't be satisfied with any less. And you've been with me when we've gone and preached at a number of different places. And what do we see consistently? Exactly that. Because the guy in the pulpit brought that hunger in with him. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh, preacher, if you're watching me today and you're a pastor in the LGBT affirming movement, let me tell you something. You can go to all the conferences you want to go to. You can listen to all the fake shouting you want to listen to. You can watch people dance around and then go out and slut it up as soon as the service is over. All you want to. And you can be satisfied with that. Or... You can face this thing real with reality. You can look at this thing realistically and you can say, Lord, I'm hungry for more. Hallelujah. I want more. I want the real thing. I remember the first time I ever met Brother Rollins went to a LGBT Pentecostal conference in uh, Louisiana. 
over there where Jimmy Swaggart is. And I, I was not familiar with these people that were having this conference. I was new to them. They were new to me. And the fellow who headed it up asked me to get up and say a few words. I got up and spoke for a little while. And uh, after a while, I began, uh, after the service, I would go out to eat with uh, Brother Rollins and his then partner. And I got to know them really well. And we developed a real nice friendship and a real good fellowship. And it was funny because a few months after this conference, Brother Rollins called me on the telephone. And we were talking on the phone because we'd become friends, you know. He and Brother Wade and I'd become friends. And he called me on the phone and he said, you know, Brother, he said, i got to confess something to you. I said, what's that? He said, do you know when you got up and spoke the first time at that conference over there in Louisiana, he said, you scared me to death. I said, what? What are you talking about? I scared you to death. He said, brother, I was raised in the home of a United Pentecostal preacher. I was in the, the apostolic church my entire life. He said, I've been in the affirming Pentecostal movement now for a number of years. He said, uh, to be honest with you, There's a lot of games that goes on in the affirming Pentecostal movement. A lot of people play games. A lot of preachers play games. They don't live what they preach, and they don't preach what they live. And they just put on a good show, and people shout and run around and act like they're Pentecostal because they want to, you know, they want to act like they're experiencing what they did growing up in church and what they knew. He said, but so much of it is just not real. He said, when you got up to speak at that conference, he said, you scared the life out of me. He said, as you were speaking, I turned to Wade, and I said to Wade, my God, that man's real. That guy believes every word he's saying. Guess what, honey? Brother Collins was right then, and he's right now. I still believe every word I'm saying. I still preach what I believe. I still believe what I preach. I'm still hungry for a move of God in our community. I still want to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost like you can't even imagine. I still want to see the power of God manifested like you have never seen the power of God. And I got news for you. We need to bring this thing to the church. We need to bring it back to the church because the mainstream so-called straight churches have lost it. It's gone to them. What are they going to say when it's a bunch of queens who relight that fire? What are they going to say when it's our hunger for righteousness and our hunger for a move of God that brings revival to the church? What are they going to say then? You wonder why the enemies fought this ministry for so many years. You wonder why the enemy doesn't want this church to succeed and this pastor to realize his vision. I'll tell you why. Because the minute it happens, we're going to set the church world on its ear. And they're going to be wondering, how, how is that even possible? That, that can't be God. But then they're going to have to look at it like the Jews did who traveled to the house of Cornelius with Peter, they're going to have to look at it and say, well, who are we to argue with God? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah, there are those who say, in order to bring the revival that we need, the move of God that we need, we need to live up to this code, to live up to this holiness standard garbage. Seems to be a simple enough answer because if you look at cause and effect and you look at church history, the holiness movement, yes, it did precede the Pentecostal movement. Others theorize, however, that prayer is the key. Revival comes when the people of God get on their knees and spend time in earnest prayer begging the Lord for an outpouring of His Spirit. 
Because after all, in their minds, it is not God's good pleasure to pour out of His Spirit upon His people, but rather He must be begged to do so. It's not true. In recent weeks, the Lord has laid on my heart this truth. All that is needed for the Lord to pour out a mighty move of God upon His people is hunger. All you need is to be hungry. The Lord has promised to feed the hungry. And this means it requires no effort on our part. All that is required is hunger. When the disciples were fishing offshore in a boat, and they came upon the Lord who was on the shore, what was He doing? He was cooking for them. Hallelujah. As the old song says, come and dine. The disciples came to land, thus obeying Christ's command, for the Master called unto them, come and dine. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Hallelujah. In Ezekiel 37, the prophet Ezekiel shares the vision that he has of what is revealed to him to be the nation of Israel. The nation was dead and dried up in a valley. It was a valley full of dry, bleached bones. Sadly, Israel did not see itself as the Lord saw them. I got news for you folks the church doesn't see itself today as God sees it they see it they see themselves as being this great power they see themselves as being this great church they see themselves all oh, our buildings have never been fuller than they are today our offering plates have never had more money in them than they do today And God's looking from heaven and saying, yeah, y'all are dead and dry and you're a bunch of bleached bones in a valley. You need revival. You need me to speak life back into you. Because if you read on in Ezekiel's vision, you know that God speaks to Ezekiel and gives him instructions. And Ezekiel is to speak to the bones and he's to give instruction to the bones. And as he does, they begin to reassemble and they begin to once again come together until finally a great army is raised up. I want to tell you something. There is the potential today for the church to be a great army, but not an army for the cause of social issues, not an army for the cause of uh, culture wars, not an army for political causes, no, an army that is able to do the work of the kingdom. Because that's what we're called to do. The work of the kingdom of God. In Acts 8 and 11, the Word of God, excuse me, in Amos 8 and 11, a prophecy in the Old Testament reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Oh my goodness. I got news for you. We're living that reality today. See, just because a preacher preaches from the Bible does not mean for one second that he's preaching the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Children, you need to get that out of your head. You know, all these people who get offended by preachers who preach out of the Bible, but they're not preaching a word from God. They're not preaching the word of God. The Word of God tells us in Romans 10, 17, the Apostle Paul wrote, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Let me tell you what comes with faith. Miracles, healings, deliverance, Holy Ghost outpouring, salvation. All those things are the byproduct of faith. 
Why are we not seeing them today? It's easy. Because the faith ain't there. Why is the faith not there? Because the Word of God is not being preached from enough pulpits. Amen. In Luke, the 16th chapter, verse 8, the Lord asks the question. Jesus asks the question. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? At the end of this age, the Lord promises that hunger, just like sickness and weeping and dying, will no longer exist. One of the greatest promises of God is this. We shall one day know what it is to never hunger again. In Revelation 7 verses 13 through 17. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Listen, they shall hunger no more. Neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into, unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The biggest issue we find within the church today is a willingness to settle. We leave the table not hungry because we swallowed a line of baloney that tells us the presence of God was here. The power of God was here. The Word of God was here. But if that were true, then faith would be present. If faith were present, then miracles would be present. My Lord, have mercy. No, no, the evidence clearly tells us that you're believing a crock of nonsense. Those things are not there, but the church is believing it. Therefore, they leave the table full, but they're full of what should have been fed to the pigs instead of what is served from the master's table. Few of us old-timers who have feasted on Holy Ghost outpourings that rival that of the day of Pentecost. We're not satisfied to leave the church relatively satisfied. We hunger for more. We desire more of the Lord, more of His Spirit, more of His power, more of His glory. And until we get all we know that He has to offer, we remain hungry, our stomachs aching and growling within us. When enough of God's people get hungry, for the same, we will see miracles, we will see healings and blessing as we've witnessed not so many years ago. But preachers today have stopped preaching the boundless blessings as we witnessed some years back. They stopped preaching great outpouring of the Holy Ghost and in so doing have denied the people of God an opportunity to grow hungry for more. See, if you keep telling people that everything is well, then they're never going to be hungry for more because they think they got everything they need. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Oh, children of God, we need not today pray more or do more. We don't need to live up to some code that has been codified by some denomination or some church group. What we need do is desire in our soul for the Lord to do more, give more, be more. For in response to our hunger, He has promised He will feed us. You need only today to be hungry. Finally today in closing, Luke 14, 16 through 17, using the words 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. You need only today to be hungry. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If you'll stand with me this afternoon.